Hi, I'm Richard Claybaugh, and today we're going to be discussing setiquette. For those who aren't familiar with the term, setiquette is just sort of proper conduct on set. It's the things that most film professionals know or should know about courtesies that we show each other that aren't written up in any official book, but that uh, when they're not followed can be sometimes very annoying or regarded as unprofessional. I'm happy today to be joined by a number of people and I would love each one to start introducing themselves, just going in order around my screen. Uh, Miss England Simpson, would you uh, care to introduce yourself briefly? Hello, my name is England Simpson. I am an actor and filmmaker. And Miss Michelle Iantuano. Perfect. <laughs> I'm Michelle Iantuano. I am the writer and director of the feature film Live Scream, uh, which is a found footage horror film that came out a couple years ago on the festival circuit. I'm also the writer and director of Destroyed Evolution, which is a fan film in the short and human universe uh, that came out this year. So I've done a couple features, several shorts, done crew work on other people's films, and so I've been on a lot of good sets and bad. <laughs> I just want to say your film Live Scream has been getting a lot of good uh, buzz. Uh, I see you've been winning a lot of festival awards, and I think it's a really wonderful concept, and uh, I am looking forward to having the chance to see it sometime. Thank you. And also joining us, Mr. Tom Gore. Hi, I'm Tom Gore, actor, filmmaker, retired Army veteran. Excellent. So... Um, Thank you guys so much for, for jumping in here. So Seneca to me is something that's just uh, not always appreciated on smaller films, mostly because people just haven't had the experience to go around. And there's certain things that, that I've run into over time that, that have kind of come out that I'm aware of. One of the things that I think of whenever I think about just basic film etiquette is clearing the actor's eyeline. Whenever I'm on a professional set, usually the AD will make sure that either there's nobody in the eye line when an actor is performing, or if they do have to be in the eye line, they know not to stare at the actor doing it during a performance. Uh, two of you primarily bill yourselves as actors, uh, uh, England and Tom, and I was just wondering if you could kind of speak about that from an actor's perspective, any experiences you've had with that or things like that that, that, that play into you. Uh, Ms. Simpson? Um, I will say this, I have been gone like full Christian bail on anyone for being in my um, eye line but it is a bit of a distraction especially if you're doing a scene where you have to draw you're drawing from an emotional place and then someone's right there in your eye line like eating a hot dog or holding the boom so it can get you out of the moment but then again, you have to remember that everyone's there to do a job. So you don't want to be that person who is complaining and upset about it. But as an actor, that I think it's really important for the director or like you said, the AD to kind of set the tone and kind of, you know, let the crew know to make sure that they are making it a very, um, a, a very uh, chill place for the actor to do their job. So I think it really is important, but it's something not to... I don't want to necessarily say flip out over, but you definitely don't want to be that person on the set that's like complaining, arguing, and just being like a diva about it. <laughs> well, let me, before I jump to Tom, just articulate a little more. Why is that such, such a big deal? I mean, there's a camera over there. There's lights over there. There's C-stands. Why is someone who just happened to be standing there that they're staring back at you? Why does that pull you out of it in a way that it just doesn't when you're in a completely fake environment already? What, why does that, you know, make a difference? Hmm. Because it's like a human being is staring at you. It's not a machine. It's not a light. It's not anything else. It's a human being. And you can communicate a lot with your eyes. So if they're looking at you directly in your eye or they're moving around, just that moment, it gets you out of it. Because you're used to the cameras and the lights and stuff. You're not used to um, maybe a, a PA walking by with a bag or something. Like You're expecting the cameras and the lights to be there. Um, Tom, what have been your experiences with that or related things? I've got three related angles for this. There's, there's the obvious one. Uh, I, I, I was the bad guy once. I was in someone's eye line and it distracted them. And I understand uh, sometimes it wasn't anything other than that's where the camera was set up, where the shot was set up, where the director set up, and I was in the wrong spot. And, I, and you know, and it's like, hey, can you get him out of my eye line? Stepped out of the way, shot rolls, everything's fine and dandy. Um, and then there's, there's the things where you need someone 
in your eye line. You need to connect to someone with your scene. So that way a, a lot of dialogue is done. Hey, I need this person in my eye line. Hey, and then, you know, sometimes you, that kid, the, uh, the actor can't be there and you got to stand in there and you have no connection with this stand in and it's going to pull away and fail. And you can tell that there's not a connection. The other person doesn't know how to react properly or the other person isn't there in the scene with you because the camera's not on them. And they're in your eye line, as much as you're trying to work to sell the connection between you and this other person based on the scene is painful because it's forced. So, and you can tell and you can read it as clear as day. So as the, far, I'm sorry. Oh, and the third one is sometimes you don't need, especially now that everything is going with this Zoom and the Corona videos, the coro everything is, I know I'm looking at you on, on my screen and Richard's there and Jason's there and Michelle's around the way. And, and so when I'm talking and I'm looking at England, who's down in my corner, I can be looking at anybody and I'm not looking at the glass, I'm not looking at the lens, yet I'm still trying to connect to someone and it may or may not work. It may or may fail. And that is, is, that's its own challenge now. Do you think it's good courtesy for that island thing if the actor you're playing opposite stays to read your off-camera lines uh, as opposed to a script supervisor? Or I know we've done it where we put an orange tennis ball on the end of a C-stand arm and you play your scene to that. Um, what are your feelings about uh, that? Uh, the, 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 the green tennis ball relationship. Oh my God, it is, that's, that's, that's steamy, it's steamy. <laughs> I, I, I've, been a, I've, I've been a part of that numerous times. It's, it has its place, has its purpose, but it's always better when it's the person you're supposed to be connecting with. Mm -hmm. uh, some people can do it. Shia LaBeouf is great at reacting to the, the great tennis ball of death. It's it's fantastic. He's he's made millions just just because of it, and I mean, and he's a Disney kid. Like what? <laughs> so yeah, the 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 tennis the tennis ball the tennis ball romance reaction ha is a thing, but it's it, it is a special skill. It is a it is a talent that you have to practice and work on. Whereas connecting with a person for your eyeline is so much more valuable. So in addition to just crew keeping the eye line clear, we do feel it's important as a courtesy for your fellow actors to stick around to do their scene with you, as opposed to reading opposite the, the script supervisor feeding lines while you stare at a tennis ball. Is that correct? Yes. It, it's, it's when you, when you get a, when you get a script supervisor and they're doing their best, they know the story inside and out. They're, they're off book, but, that connection isn't there that the whether it's anger whether it's love whether it's lust mm -hmm. whether it's pride whether it's ownership whether it's anything it's that that element at ta intangible tangible is gone yeah when it's not that person mm -hmm. it's the authenticity of it it is it really is and most actors you know we, we're all there to collaborate and to create I, I've never met an actor who had an issue with just staying, you know, and reading their lines while the close-ups on me. Like I've never ran into an actor that had that problem. So I've never had the tennis ball. Maybe one day, <laughs> maybe one day I'll get that tennis ball, but you, you'll get there. I am, I there. am very <laughs> sorry to say that I have seen that happen more often than, than it probably should. Michelle, as a director and a filmmaker, when you run your set, what are the things that you feel are important and that you try to make sure are, are done in what you feel is, is good set etiquette? Um, I just think that people are the best resource, or not, not the, necessarily the best resource they are, but the most important resource that you have as a filmmaker. Um, it's, we don't have money, we don't have great gear, you know, we have people, and that should be your number one priority in making a schedule, running a set, everything, is to make sure your people are happy. Um, I've, on my last set, told a lot of the actors that as the director, I worry on behalf of everyone so that other people don't have to. And this means that, you know, everybody's well fed and well hydrated at all times. And I hire people to make sure that other people are hydrated and are eating. 
Um, I stagger call times to make sure that no one is on set a minute longer than they need to be. Now, of course, I don't believe in the whole tennis ball thing myself. I think that if you have a scene that you are in, you need to be there, even if it is not your coverage. Um, but I think that scheduling yourself in a way where, you know, you have some people who are going to be there all day. They, they're in every scene, they're the main characters. But if you have um, a bit player who's only there for three scenes, you know, you can schedule all three of those scenes back to back most of the time, uh, you know, location depending, and make sure that, you know, they have a compressed block of time where they can work and they're not, you know, sitting around in a chair for four hours. Um, so that's really important to me is to respect people's time, uh, respect that, you know, people are just generally doing you a favor by coming to work for you. Yes, you're paying them, presumably, and yes, you're including them. But at the end of the day, you're the one who wants to make the movie more than anybody. So yeah. <laughs> this is a negotiation between you and the people who are working with you. It's almost like a hostage negotiation where they are holding your vision hostage and you have to please them. Um, so <laughs> it, it is one of those things where I, I really do believe in, um, in treating people right. And, and that's one of the things that I think um, my reputation as a filmmaker has not developed into one necessarily of uh, about the movies that I even make, it's it's been more developed about what I'm like to work with, and I like that that perceives me more than anything. Hey guys, so here's another one that that comes up on set kind of periodically more and more these days. Um, intimate scenes between actors um, and how to deal with that. I've uh, I have uh, had the 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 pleasure, blessing, or mixed mixed uh, ability. <laughs> mixed luck to have shot many different types of very intimate scenes between people and they've been handled differently. I kind of want to hear from Michelle as a director, your views on this, but then I definitely would like to hear from both Tom and England about any scenes they've had to do of an intimate nature and their feelings as performers, what they want from a crew on set. So Michelle going to you first. I think that when it comes to any sort of intimacy on set, the first step is to put it in the casting call. I mean, that's really, you have to be transparent about that stuff up front. And then the last film I did, Detroit Evolution, which is a romance film, um, I was very clear. I was like, this will require, you know, two same sex kisses from your character, you know, no nudity, no sex, and basically outlined um, all this stuff. And what's interesting as well is I, I have a lot of female casting calls that I post that are just innocuous. And so many of the female actresses get back to me and they, they ask, will this role require nudity or will this role, role require sex? And it's like, no, not remotely, <laughs> like not, not, not at all. That's why it wasn't mentioned. But they've been burned so many times by, you know, roles that they audition for that aren't transparent about that up front. Um, so that's your first step is you have to be very clear of if, if there's nudity, if there's sex, even if there's, you know, a, a love interest in your movie, put that in the casting call so that they know when they audition. Uh, when you actually cast them and everything, I think it's important to have uh, them rehearse and meet with the person they're, they're going to be, you know, the scene partner for these intimate scenes. Uh, I think it would be very awkward if they show up on set and meet that person that day. Um, I also scheduled our production schedule in a way where that was by far not the first thing that we shot. We didn't start shooting that until the end of the third day so that they had many days together to get to know each other on set and get into their characters. Uh, and then finally, when you're actually shooting, uh, for me, there was no nudity or, or sex or anything, but just for kissing, I, you know, only ever had the cinematographer in the room with them because it wasn't just, oh, you know, we're kissing. These were highly emotional scenes. There was very heavy emotional dialogue attached. Uh, they really needed to get in the right mental space to be able to perform those scenes in addition to the physicality. Um, so what about your boom operator if there was dialogue in the scene? Oh, we didn't use boom. We only used uh, lapel. Um, although for the second scene, there was a boom operator, but he was pretty far away. We were on a small porch. So basically, Brett was a cinematographer, was in the doorway of the porch, and then the boom operator was sort of beside him, and then the guys were like, uh, you know, three feet forward on the ledge of the porch. Um, but, you know, there wasn't a lot of space anyway. Um, but nobody was in their eyeliner. It was just pretty much, you definitely just don't want the catering manager and the PA and, you know, everything else um, in their way or in their space if they don't have to be. Um, but yeah, for the, for the one scene, I think, actually, I think uh, my husband Austin, who did the, the sound, I think he just put the boom on a C-stand in that first scene. Uh, he just 
basically put the boom off to the side, but we primarily use lapel mics for all our sound anyway, so that's how we did it. That, that works if you, uh, if it's an intimate scene where everyone's fully dressed. You, you, you right, <laughs> luckily. Well, you know, every, every scene is different. And so if you're in a situation where, you know, you're doing like a, a nude scene in bed, I imagine you definitely don't want the boom operator like holding a boom over them. That might be the case where they're in the bed, they're not going anywhere. Maybe just put it on a stand on the side, right out of shot, you don't need a person there. England, um, as a performer who's had to answer campaign calls, what's been your experience with some of that? Um, I definitely, I always favor a close set, but um, I've been on sets where I've had an intimate scene and everybody and their mom was mm. there just hanging out. And it definitely made it very uncomfortable. I've also been on sets where I walk in the first day and that's the first thing they shoot. So you can just get it out of the way. And so now that it's out of the way, you're, you, you don't have to be shy about anything. So I, I really do think um, actors need you to be a little more sensitive about things like that. I mean, yes, they're professionals, but you know, you don't want to just be wide open and then like the caterers back there and the PAs walking by and, and every, you just feel like, I mean, being an actor, you're already exposed, but to add that level to it when it's unnecessary, it just, it kind of feels unfair. Mm -hmm. And so um, I appreciate the directors that are very aware of that and they go out of their way to make you com as comfortable as possible. So, I mean, but then again, I'm, I'm gonna get on set and do what I need to do, but you, you, you will always remember the directors that made it a point to make that situation as comfortable as possible. And so then as a director, I also, if I have any, any intimate scenes, which I've never shot any intimate scenes as a director, but if and when I do, I'm, I'm really gonna take the time to really map it out and make sure that the actors are afforded all of those uh, comforts. Like a close set, definitely, that's a, that's a plus. Um, what did I, I have yet to be cast as a romantic lead in anything. <laughs> so uh, from, from my standpoint, is mostly as a filmmaker, uh, the, uh, through the training, schools and everything, you teach you intimacy in the scenes, you know, it's supposed to be based on trust. Mm -hmm. It is 100% sold on trust. Unfortunately, a lot of the casting calls, a lot of the production companies that come through just throw it out ambiguously and rely on faith. And they think it's the same. And it's not. And that's where people get burned, as Michelle brought up. It's where there's expectations that are mismanaged, as England has experienced. Um, and for the scene, for us to connect with our heroes or our villains or our characters that need, they, they have to have some type of level of trust. And production has to give them that ability and time and opportunity a lot of people do knock that out right off the bat in the first bat let's get it on get it out of the way and let's go and then they'll actually shoot the rest of the movie everything so it's either it's in the the, the kissing scene the intimate scene is done as an afterthought it's put in there just to just because of the rush just because of their some type of dramatic storytelling element and not putting any type of connection between the two people that are playing the characters pulls it away and actually does it a disservice. Um, putting the kissing scene at the end of the movie should also be at the end of the shooting schedule. As long as your actors that are performing are both comfortable with it. And if they they've built a rapport on a 21, 28 day shoot with each other, knocking out all the scenes, then that type of thing will happen and it will be more natural for them. It won't be forced. It won't be rushed. It won't be pressured. And you'll actually get more of an honest element in the scene. And it will by far give you more of an impact at the end because your audience will know where that, where that is actually done in the lives of these characters more than just uh, put in the beginning dropped in editor take care of it we'll put in some extra flash fireworks <laughs> and, 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 yeah and reality it, it's more real if you can tell that it's real if there's a rapport if mm -hmm. there's a build there if it's just oh it's first scene let's get this knocked out that way yeah. 
all the uncomfortable is knocked out for everyone, it's going to look uncomfortable and you're going to come back for a reshoot and they're just getting your, your talent's going to look at each other. Like, you know why we're doing this? Yep. Cause they fucked this on the first day. Mm-hmm. And that's literally the words that are kind of come out of their mouth. I'm using my one there, Jason, just want you to know. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Tom, fun. I actually, I actually want to follow up on that because it's a really good point about the, the shooting order because when we were, when I was doing the shooting schedule for Detroit Evolution, we, we had something similar to where the first kiss scene was this very highly emotional reunion scene between these two characters. It was like a love confession scene. It was very, very intense. And then the second kiss was very casual. It was very, it was the last moment of the film. They were very comfortable with each other by that point as characters. So I'm glad that we shot them in that order because if I had had them do the comfortable one first, I mean, I know that the first few that we shot were awkward. It took them a while to kind of get the choreography right with each other and get comfortable with each other. So, yeah, I'm glad we didn't end the movie on awkwardness. I'm glad we were able to sort of push through the emotional, you know, highly emotional stuff first, get it out of the way, and then both actors and characters can kind of breathe. And you feel that and you see that in the final moments of the film for sure. I, uh... I'll weigh in here just a little bit because I've had a, a lot of experiences with these things. It's it's funny to talk to people who aren't in the business because outside of our industry, the entertainment industry, the performance industry, performing arts, most people don't have jobs where they will go in and watch their coworkers strip naked and simulate a sexual act as part of their daily nine to five job. It doesn't come up a lot, but I have had that happen and come home to you know, my wife, well, what'd you do today? Oh, I watched blank and blank, you know, all afternoon as we did various angles on this love scene. It's a living. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're, and, and I've seen it done correctly and I have seen it done as badly as it could be done. But something I haven't seen yet, but I've run into recently is the addition of what's called an intimacy director. And apparently there is a, a feeling that a performer may not feel because of their relationship with the director that they're comfortable to tell them what they're not comfortable doing. If you're an actor, you may not feel you're in a position to say to the director, I don't want to do that. So they have now a, a, an intimacy director whose job is to liaison between everyone and they are now required on certain shows. Part of this came out of the sexual harassment lawsuits that uh, were coming up and it's become a matter of courtesy now um, as performers and as a director, what are your feelings about the addition of this person? Would you rather just deal directly with the director and tell them what you want, or do you want a third party there to, to intermediate for you? I'm gonna start again with England, if I, if I may. Yeah, uh, as a director, I would hope that my actors are comfortable enough with me to let me know what they're not comfortable with or what they are not willing to do, what line they will not cross. I would hope they, we have that relationship, that we build that type of relationship with each other to where they could tell me that. But I mean, I'm all for an intimacy director. I mean, if if it makes, I wouldn't even say an uncomfortable scene. If it makes something that is, um, well, I will say uncomfortable. If if, it, if it'll take an uncomfortable situation and just put a little ease to it, then I'm for it. But like I said, as as a director, I would hope that my actors trust me enough to let me know that they're not comfortable with certain things and that we've already had that conversation before you even pop that top off and get to work. I, I would hope we'd have already had that conversation. Michelle? Uh, I have a similar answer to where, uh, yeah, I would also hope that I could just have an open dialogue. And, and honestly, even when it comes to highly emotional, intense, you know, panic inducing sort of scenes uh, for actors. You know, I, I discussed with them beforehand, a safe word to say to stop the scene. I discussed with them beforehand, um, you know, how to deescalate them from the emotion of the scene. You know, we, we try to have a very open dialogue to keep them safe. Uh, but I also agree that if I had the budget and especially if I had something that was uh, really sexual in nature and not just, you know, hand holding or kissing, but actual like nudity and sexuality, um, I wouldn't be against it, especially because intimacy directors, in addition to, um, you know, negotiating and being that middle party, that, that safe space for the actors, they also, I believe, help tell them how to make it look good. <laughs> so oh. they, they, they kind of help guide, you know, okay, so if you're going to be camera facing this way, this is how you want to do this in order for it to, you know, look more pleasing to the eye and stuff. So, um, and I don't really want to have that conversation necessarily with my actors. <laughs> 
answers. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want to necessarily have to say, um, you know, to, to actually direct the intimacy that's happening. I, I think going through somebody who's more um, seasoned in that and is more comfortable doing that would be a plus. So I'm not against it at all. And Tom? I, I, see, I see a very similarity between the intimacy director as well as a stunts coordinator. Um, no one, no one in the talent area wants to be a one and done. They don't just want to do the one thing and done. They, they want to make a career out of it. They want to make a franchise out of it. They want to make more sequels, more marketing, more everything. And so when you come up into these high, high risk areas, either intimacy or a stunt where certain things can happen, relationships, injuries, diseases, uh, broken bones, it, all these things all get wrapped up into that high risk category and having an intimacy, intimacy director as well as a stunt coordinator helps the liability because I, I, I don't want to tell Michelle, I, I just, I just can't kiss that dude. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, I just fired myself. No, no talent wants to go, Hey, how do I just sabotage my career? How do I get cast out of this movie? You know, when I go, when I go to the next audition, it says here you were working on, it says on this, we got an old uh, resume and it says you were working on this movie. Uh, what's the status on that movie? I don't know. I got canned. Oh, so you're going to get canned from this movie right at the audition process. Nobody even wants to set up that series of negative life events. So it's, I, I need a liaison. I need an educator. Uh, adjudicator word person that actually speaks on your behalf and helps you through this thing because you want to do the job you want it to look right you don't want to do it wrong you you want to continue your profession your career in a positive manner and these people are here to help not just the production but also help you as long as you're all on the same page and it helps with another layer of trust I, I really like the comparison to a stunt coordinator there, that, that it's a specialized thing and do that. I also do like the idea of someone being able to feel they can speak and not put their situation in jeopardy. I do have to say two things playing devil's advocate here. As a director, I feel I want to have a rapport with my actors that I can speak with them intimately about their character issues on an intimate level, because that's a really important thing that's not not quite as emotionally at the core of a character in a story as the stunts are. So I feel like it is important that the director have that relationship, but at the same time, I see whatever good intentions, the discomfort that could happen. And then the other flip side of this is, I was a, a cinematographer on one film and there was some really strong sexual content in it, which, was, which came out of the nature of the story. And after we were two weeks into filming, um, the actress, there was two different actresses doing two different things, both said, you know what, I'm not comfortable doing this. And it's like, the production was like, wait a minute, the, the distribution company said, we're making this film, you signed on for this film, this was not surprising, this was very clearly in the script. Now two weeks in, where we're, we cannot possibly replace you, you are saying, yeah, you know what, I'm not gonna do what was in the script. So I feel like if you have read the script and you did know it was there, do you feel there's an obligation to go forward with what was there, uh, England? Or Tom has his hand up. Tom. Oh, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> they knew. They knew. At, they knew day one at the table read that they were going to do that. They knew day one. They waited the two weeks of production to own a trump card to play it because they didn't want to do it. They both didn't know. They both knew they didn't want to do it on day one. It was premeditated and, and it hurts the rest of us. So under the category of set kit, just the, the responsibility I think that both production has to the performers to make sure that their situation is disclosed, to make sure that the situation is a safe working environment where they feel comfortable, but also the responsibility of a performer to acknowledge what you will and won't do before we get into the process. Does everyone sort of agree that that's kind of a two-way street or... I I think that consent is one of those things that is not continuous, yeah. but it is tough because, you know, it's one of those situations where you might read a script and you might uh, see that there's intimate scenes and you go into it with this expectation of how things will be run on the set and everything. 
and then you get there and it's a complete disaster and they make you feel very uncomfortable and maybe the actor that you're working with your scene partner is inappropriate and takes advantage of you during the shooting of the scene yeah. you know things things can happen throughout the shooting process that maybe change your mind to make it not be something where you knew that you didn't want to do it on day one and then you just like sat on it for two weeks um, but it is it is tough because as a director, I mean, do we just sort of accept that risk? Do we just sort of, okay, there's going to be a sex scene in my film and I just got to cross my fingers and hope that, you know, people don't change their minds after. I, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's a very tough question because I do want to respect the fact that, you know, things can happen through the process and, and people have a, a change of heart about things. And I think that even if they are contractually obligated to something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing to do to hold that over their heads if, if trauma is legitimate, you know? Yeah. I really like the way you said that consent is not continuous. It's not, you know, un irrevocable. In the case of this particular film, I think that one actress had grown uncomfortable with the leading man and over the course of events. And I think the other one had grown uncomfortable with the director who seemed mm. to be enjoying the opportunity to do these scenes more exactly. than you can mm -hmm. do and i think as they became aware of that that would those were factors that contributed mm -hmm. to it but at the same time the production company's point of view was no this is not the movie we hired you to do we yeah. didn't we didn't want a pg-13 film this is an edgy adult thriller so would, about this, infidelity. would the circumstance possibly be changed then if they could negotiate like a change in their scene partner or something. I mean, I don't know. This is probably not the budget for that. Well, and so there are they body doubles. <laughs> there are body doubles, and those, those have yeah. been used. But, uh, yeah. So moving away from this, if we could just for a moment, because I uh, don't want it to be only a sex talk here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and issues that have arised on set where you would like to see that people watching this would know as filmmakers be more sensitive to these aspects and, you know, understand what your fellow filmmakers and, and artists on the set have to deal with. And uh, I'm going to go different order. So I'm going to start with Tom. Oh, yes. Um, directors need to understand that uh, us as talent, we're a guy or a girl playing another guy or another girl. Um, what we have spent time rehearsing, studying, characterization, figuring out who this person that we read off a piece of paper is. We didn't meet the writer. We didn't meet the person who the writer is taking this influence from when he met this person when he was in third grade 35 years ago. We don't know who that person is. We have what's on the script in the piece of paper that we are contractually obligated to flesh out and figure out his tics, her nervousness, her, her motivations, her goals, her, her life as we display this thing. And that person's going to have its own vulnerabilities, her own system, her own thought patterns, the process. And so a lot of directors have spent time, they've figured out like, all right, I just more or less need to guide this person that hey, we have product placement endorsements to take care of. So I know she doesn't like it, but we've got to hold this Coca-Cola bottle up for five seconds. And so even though she just takes a swig and drinks it back down, she's got to pause for that. Or he's got to, you know, he's got to put on shoes. He doesn't like wearing shoes. He, he likes wearing sandals, but he's got to wear Timberlands for the commercial aspect to ensure that the contract obligation is fulfilled. Um, so those things come into play, even though the character it's himself or herself doesn't even want to even deal with those things. And that's where production has to come in and take care of those things to ensure that the checks are getting coming through. Um, and after a while, you figure this out. But as you're going through your scenes, when you're going through your, your arc, and you're trying to get there from point A to point B and that journey as each character goes, where I'm at, if you're jumping around, okay, we're shooting scene uh, 33 today, then we're going to jump immediately to scene 12, 11, and 10. One, you're doing backwards 
it's backwards right there. So your actor's got to be knowing that he's supposed to be at a low point at 35 and a happy point at 12, 11, and 10 with increased happiness in 12 than in 10. And it's, it's taxing. It is mentally exhausting and emotionally stripping to jump and be bipolar in that day to tell the story in that manner and method. And it's been done time and time again. And, and you can either do it and you can handle it because it's what's needed or you're not going to get all them IMDB credits. Uh, so I would, I would summarize that as filmmakers need to be cognizant that their actors are playing characters who have emotional journeys and they have to make sure that they create an environment that allows them to take that journey as effectively as possible. Is that a way of summarizing that? That's about 99% correct. <laughs> I like the uh, weather forecast approach of depression in the morning with increasing happiness during the afternoon, <laughs> breaking out into sunny attitudes and laughter by uh, sunset. England, what are your experiences? Um, I agree with Tom with that. Um, I know from a production director standpoint, that maybe location, um, time constraints, um, resources you have, it, it may be beneficial to shoot certain things out of order, but you gotta remember to keep your actors at a certain mindset. Yeah, you have to really be aware of that and um, respect the process. So definitely respect the process. Um, I also agree with Michelle, like really manage and, and really manage the time of, of the people you have on set if they don't necessarily have to be there for 12 hours, you have to make sure you're keeping those things in mind, especially it will be cost effective. You're not feeding all those people when you look at what you're shooting, you look at your shoot schedule and you make sure that you're scheduling people appropriately. You got to stagger that stuff. And as an actor, um, I would say you really have to respect the fact that it's filmmaking. Don't be that person complaining nonstop about or why aren't we ready yet? Just know that it's a hurry up and wait type of situation. It's very hard to have people on set. You tell them, listen, the, being on the set is, is like a long, it, it's a long day. I mean, but if you're, I mean, if you're budgeting your time for the most part, it shouldn't be too, too long, but just giving uh, people who are fresh and have never been on the set before, just kind of get, giving them that little nugget and then they get there and then three hours later they're complaining and they're angry. It's really hard to, um, you know, get past that because then you're in a spot where you feel like you have to defend yourself and defend the decisions you've made. So just being aware of that, uh, make sure you are, if you're waiting a long time as an actor, just always have your material in front of you, always be studying, um, be courteous, be nice to other people on set because you never know if that could ruin, <laughs> if that could ruin a whole scene, a whole shot because you were being rude and now people don't want to work with you and you're at a spot where you're being a creepy, creeper or you were um, just flat out being rude to anyone, whether it's your, someone you're doing a scene with or, or, do, or PA or the woman running craft services, you were just being rude. So now you just put a whole funk over the set just by being a jerk. Don't do that. Bring materials that you can study with. Bring things that are quiet, that you can look over. Um, sometimes I even bring my own chair to set <laughs> so that I could be comfortable, but just don't be that person. That's my thing. Don't be that person. And if you don't know what I mean, then you are that person. <laughs> Weed and roll. Don't be a dick. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to keep it clean. <laughs> don't be a dick. <laughs> oh my God. Well, <laughs> Somebody said the people you meet going up the ladder are the people you will meet when you're going back down again. Um, mm -hmm. When gays become directors, it, uh, it, it mm -hmm. happens. And uh, I think as far as the waiting around goes, I think there's one very famous actor who always said, the acting I do for free, they pay for the waiting. Um, yeah. Michelle, why don't you bring it on home for a final comment here and, uh, and, and take it on, on to bed for us. Um, so I definitely agree with both Tom and England um, about prepping actors before scenes, giving them a little refresher about, okay, so you just came from the hospital, you know, just giving them context before a scene because we do shoot out of order. Um, my sets tend to be block locations, so it's like we'll shoot all at this location and it might be scene three, scene 15, and scene 37 <laughs> all in the same day and out of order. 
So uh, yeah, that's really polite to do to your actors for sure. And also, as they were saying, uh, maintain the mood of the scene. If they just shot like a scene where this actor is talking to another character while they're in a coma and it's a very like intense emotional monologue, don't yell cut and then make a joke. Like breaking tension is one thing, but you do want to keep your actor in that space. Uh, keep your voice low, keep the tension high um, so that they don't have to work as hard to get back into that headspace for another take. Mm -hmm. um, some things that haven't been mentioned yet, um, we're all directors. A lot of us know other directors and we help out on each other's sets, but it's very important to not direct on somebody else's set. Um, this happens a few times here and there, where Absolutely. if you're, you know, if you're a director who's been called in to do sound or PA work or as a DP, this can easily happen as well. Um, make sure to let the director do their thing. You're there to perform a role that they asked you to do stay in your lane and don't start working with actors and making suggestions unless they are solicited. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, <laughs> I have, um, don't poke the bear and choose what hills to die on. Um, especially this actually, I think goes more for people who aren't the director um, in my experience. There will be, uh, especially actors who will have suggestions about things that they want to change about the script choose your battles in that case because as a director i only have so much mental energy to manage this set and all the people on it if you're coming to me every five minutes can i change this can i change this can i change this it becomes very exhausting to have to devote that much energy just to one person pick two lines that you just absolutely have to change and you absolutely want to hear feedback on the rest of it Again, maybe you should have figured that out in the rehearsal process. You know, we could have talked about it in rehearsal. We could have talked about it in the six to eight weeks before we shot the film. If you're on set, that's the version of the script that we're going with by that point. There has to kind of be a cutoff and acceptance of that. Uh, and then finally, for directors, uh, a director is the baton of morality for the entire set. If you lose your cool and you start screaming at people and everything, the whole set will fall apart because clicks will form, gossip will form, morale will drop, people will drop. If you gotta go scream in a parking lot away from everybody else in order to get that tension out, you go do it, but don't let anybody see you. Come back with a smile and continue leading your set because the morale of everything, again, it's hostage negotiation. If you have to put on a fake smile, pretend that everything's fine in order to get the footage and get the performances that you want out of these folks so that you can have that vision of your film at the end of the day and have the thing that you want to accomplish accomplished. That's what you have to do. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's it, I think. That's everything for me. <laughs> that's awesome. That's actually beautiful to wrap it up on. Thank you so much, Michelle. Actually, thank all of you for, for taking the time to do this. I think that there was some lovely stuff, and I like the fact that everyone brought their perspectives to this stuff very much. Thank you very much for that very good summary, Michelle. And Tom and England, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. It was a pleasure, yeah. and I hope to have the pleasure of working with all of you on something someday in the near future. Yes, please. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>